so much for joining us at the Sable Public Library. Welcome to those who are watching over live stream as well. As you leave today, please take a moment to fill out the evaluations we have left on your chair. These help us to plan for future programs. And speaking of the program, we are grateful to have Allison here as a visiting artist. She has four more events with us over the next four months. The next event is Ekphrasis Poetry on Wednesday, May 18th at 6 p.m. Participants will learn about ekphrasis, the use of detailed descriptions of visual art as a literary device. Keep an eye on our calendar for more events. <laughs> Allison Blevins is a poet and a publisher who writes confessional free verse poetry and finds inspiration in both traditional and pop culture. She writes to confess her sins and to connect with a world she feels largely disconnected from as a neurodiverse person and a person with a physical disability. Her work centers difference and queerness in a world that seeks to push her to the margins. She uses hybrid techniques to open the boundaries of free verse. Her work lives in a space between poetry, flash nonfiction, and abstract art. Please help me welcome Alison Blevins. <laughs> that was good clapping. Um, I, I'm going to start with a few um, poems from other books before reading the new book, um, just to, to warm everybody up. Um, this one comes from my chat book, Letters to Joan, and these are all acrostic like, poems based on the abstract art of um, the painter Joan Mitchell. And we're very grateful to the Joan Mitchell Foundation for letting us use um, one of her pieces of art on the cover, which has made my publishing career probably. <laughs> um, I, I became obsessed with ekphrasis um, during my MFA because it, it became really a way to, to write about trauma um, without being very depressing, and um, it's definitely influenced the trajectory of my work, um, and I'm obsessed with Joan Mitchell. Um, one of the things that's just fascinating about her is that she apparently had synesthesia, which is, you know, you can taste blue or um, feel a smell, um, and that has, also been really a, an influence on my writing and imagery. This is called The Color of Tearing after Joan Mitchell's Hemlock, 1956. Some women say red is more ghost than shadow, more rising than lurking, welling than draining. Some women say flies nip at the sweet running edges of a child's skin open to breathing light. Some women say more blue, always. Red is just memories, a mother who never returns, a lover's pants badly creased, the distance between father and daughter, tinny and coiled. Some women say blue is screaming from the mouth like the sizzle of hairs, red too sharp, too fast, the lost breath of running, the crisp hard earth on a back at landing. Some women say the color of the tear must be the dark green of a pine, the thump of a zipper catching, the pied hum of a baby being born still. Some women want to say being torn is yellowed separation, like two pages spread to empty them of spatulas, dust pans, small mossy statues that fall from inside a once white closed body. Some want, they spend their wanting like coins. Some want color like the promises of gold, a shimmer kissed on the mouth. Some women know shading, patient beneath each embrace, know what comes after, separation and the wisp of clothes unclinging, electric body unplugging from the leafy pull of another body. Some women know. The sky pulls out its hair at our distance. A mother tries to explain impermanence 
to her small child. The sky listens. The sky wants to fall down on both of them, wrap them in a tight, cold band of breath and water. Um, and I'm going to read a couple from Slowly. Suddenly, this is my first full-length collection. It came out last September. And um, it, this is it, the seventh uh, iteration of the book. So for people who think that publishing is easy, it's definitely not. It took me probably uh, 10 years to get this <laughs> book published. And um, it's been through lots of... Um, again, uh, versions, and um, this one, the fulcrum of the book is a piece called Slowly Suddenly. It's um, in Little Vignettes that Hotspur and I were talking about earlier, and I'm not going to um, read it, but it's relevant to the, to the book that I'm about to read and really got me to this book, and I think that's how writing works sometimes. Um, and um, it, it, so it's a, about my being diagnosed with MS. Um, and so this book deals with, um, with that and, again, with trauma. Um, and I guess I, I never say, like, there's a trigger warning, but it, all the things that I write about are <laughs> triggering. <laughs> um, so um, just to say that now. <laughs> Um, so I'm obsessed with ekphrasis and um, after the birth of our youngest child, um, you, you sit on the sofa a lot and breastfeed all day long and that's all you really do when you have an infant and uh, you watch TV and I realized that at all times of the day on pretty much every channel, Keeping Up With The Kardashians is on. <laughs> and so I got, I, I had I never really watched it. Um, and so I, I started and became obsessed with Keeping Up With The Kardashians. So a, a lot of the poems in this book are, um, so Ephrasis is writing about art, it's a lyric technique. Um, traditionally where you describe the art, you know, the old dead white guys would describe urns and stuff like that, but um, I'm trying to sort of do different things with it process, so I'm asking you to really take um, a broad <laughs> definition of art when we consider keeping up with the Kardashians art. Um, and a lot of the Kardashian poems are doubly ekphrastic, so they're also pulling images from more traditional um, pieces of art. So this one's titled Season 4, Episode 11, Delivering Baby Mason, and if you're not a Kardashian fan, the title does tell you what's happening in that episode. <laughs> and the epigraph is after Gino Severini's Mother and Child, 1916. I'm watching a woman pull her own child from her body. I can't believe he's all mine. Woman folds and folds into squares and to herself disappears. I am a kitchen yellowed tile, bacon, butter and splatter. I am stink and vinegar sting. Woman pulls her own child from her body. Woman in a luxury car on the back of a motorcycle, pruning in the yard or tub, folding. I am a chair. I am leaking petals and leaves from my breast. I once slept in a motel, door cracked open to the outside, chain pulled tight. From the bed, stars glinted through a still creased curtain accidentally left open by an elbow or shoe. On the street, on a payphone, a passerby stared. Her hair and skirt pocket familiar. She became flowers, then me, then child, and I am watching her watching me. I am watching a woman pull her own child from her body. We are folding into her. She watches the child at my breast from the screen, from the street, from two towns over, my own mother, lips rosed and eyes sharp turns to look. 
on a patch of brown folding to green surrounded by naked ladies austere and leafless and foreboding as though the future has been seen and spoken woman and child woman and child woman and child um, those naked ladies are not naked ladies they're the the lilies that have um that looks like sticks and little pink flowers leaves on the top um, that Gino Severini painting is here in Arkansas. What's that art museum? Crystal Bridges. Crystal Bridges. Yeah, it's there. Um, so the epigraph to this poem is after season six, episode 15, Kim's fairy tale wedding. And what has happened is that um, Kim's marrying Chris Humphreys. It's a second wedding, I think. And um, they made a really big deal about the wedding. It was like a two-part two special, and the whole season leading up to it was about the wedding. And then by the time that this episode aired, they had to put a, um, a warning or like a disclaimer uh, in before the episode aired. And it basically, can I, I swear, it, it basically said, like, you know, we fucked up really badly. You know, we should not have done this because by the time it aired, they'd already announced they were getting divorced. They were, you know, like married for three days or something like that. Um, and uh, so that inspired this poem. Facebook suggests I might know a man. <laughs> His hair is long, struggles limply in the small picture, but the name I remember Hard to forget this first kiss, 11 years old, with tongue. To forget how he pushed me hard against the bricks of his house, still covered with raindrops. The grass, unmowed for weeks in fall rains, covered with raindrops. He kissed me hard, his tongue hard, his hand hard as it pressed and pressed hard between my legs. I didn't feel any of it. He's in a wheelchair now. You're wrong. I don't tell you this because it is just or judgment. It is simply so. I'd rather have held the rain close, close as the drops I'd watched run down the blades as if paused on my brother's VCR, held how after my sweater pilled in the small space where my upper back pressed hard into brick. Seeing him like this should have made me feel but nothing is as good as it looks on the screen. Hotel room towels, cheeseburgers, politicians, not even kisses. I tell my students that a VCR is that thing that we used to watch movies on. And then today I bought a DVD. Uh, you have to pre-buy the DVDs of your children's dance recitals. And then I had to message my husband and go, oh my God, I bought a DVD. We don't own a DVD player, <laughs> but I'm told the Xbox plays those. So it does. <laughs> this thing will never watch, but I bought it anyway for thirty dollars. Okay. <laughs> this is my newest book. It came out in April, um, and um, so in 2019, um, our daughter, our baby. Um, we have two other children who I swear I write about, um, but the, the youngest was one-ish, she just one and a half, and um, um, I couldn't feel my toes, and then um, the numbness spread up to my hips, which is where the slowly, suddenly um, idea comes from, and uh, I'm very interested in how things can be two things at once, and that happens a lot in all of the books. Um, and uh, eventually was diagnosed with MS. Of course, it took a very long time and have, had lear have learned to walk again a couple of times since then. Um, and so I, I said, say that I'm a, you know, like a poet of trauma and that somebody sometime wrote that the, everybody's a poet of Something and I couldn't remember what the other things were till I did a reading the other day and um, one of the and of course I will never come up with a writer's name because that's what MS brain does. 
says, but um, hope and what was the other one? Do you remember, babe? No, a hope and outrage. So uh, those, there's at least three that I can remember now, hope, outrage, and trauma for me. And um, this book, and then I have another coming out. Now it's coming out in March next year is um, called Cataloging Pain. And I actually wrote it first. Um, and these books are about um, dealing with this trauma of MS. And I keep thinking that, you know, eventually I'll be able to stop um, because, you, you know, you're supposed to like move on from grief. But it, um, it seems that this is the sort of grief that never ends because each day something else is wrong and there's an emergency. So at least I'll have lots to write about from um, for now on. <laughs> uh, recently I read Joan Kwan Glass's uh, book Night Swim um, from Diode and you should uh, definitely read it. She's also a Harbor Editions author and that book is um, set up into the five stages of grief and it really, before I got my copies of this book, started me thinking about, um, you know, how I was writing through grief and trauma and um, I apparently I'm doing it all wrong because the, I think this is the anger book and I, it was not supposed to come before the de depression. Anyway, the, the cataloging pain book is the depressed book. <laughs> so if you like depression, that comes out in March. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, we have some time. So these are set up into, these are chapters, um, five sections each, five lines, and I really wanted it to look like a handbook, and I'm very grateful to Blaze Box for making it. I want it to look like, you know, when you get that thing that's taped to your refrigerator, that's how I hoped it would look, the, the shape at least. After Rembrandt's self-portrait damaged by acid in 1977. One, a woman opens and closes window curtains inside the tight walls of her childhood bedroom. A green orb explodes behind her clenched eyelids. Chemical stars packed into shells propelled by gunpowder and flame. I can't remember how I learned to masturbate in this room, girl young and blue with fresh wanting, handle properly or risk serious injury, even death. Two, my daughter clinches melting chocolate in her right hand, a wad of yellow chrysanthemum trailing root and dirt in her left. She wears a pink leotard and my black Jackie O's upside down on her deep sloped nose. Mothers struggle with the crisp sunshine with certainty. At 40, will my daughter still walk? Understand the overflowing burden of blur and tremor. I won't live to see her. Three, a young deer chases a blackbird in the empty lot beside the hospital parking lot. I fucked a boy on a picnic table next to a pond one teen drunk Saturday night. I don't remember his hands or name. The animal body is liquid. I'm supposed to feel hopeful as if some moments belong just to me. Remember how the mist from peeled citrus saturates skin for days after you've swallowed its crisp pulp. Four, my postpartum depression wasn't your fault and other apologies I never spoke race in my liquid medicine guts. I want to mail you postcards from the bedroom, but we keep the stamps in the kitchen. As a girl, I spent my days in dance class. That body still lives inside this body. You're so much more flexible than I expected, says the physical therapist. I'm insulted. Five, imagine every body as a widow maker heart, blue and pulsing, waiting for interrogation. How pain speaks to legs or torsos or eyeballs. What is left in my body to confess? Hot iron, rack, Pair, rats, boot, prod, chair, ice, shock, whip, thumbscrew, rope. 
Perhaps the space around a body in pain matters more than the body itself. I tell my son we only understand happiness because of death. They only get more depressing. <laughs> Maybe this is the depressing book too. Um, this, one's, this one's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I mean not as in like good, like as in less depressing. Maybe it's good. Um, I wanted to write um, these poems that had photo illustrations, but of course there's um, no photo, just accessibility notes, um, because, um, well, you know, the idea is that it's supposed to simulate, I suppose, for able-bodied um, folks for one second. Um, what it feels like to live in a disabled body, but also um, it made me laugh and I thought, screw them, those able-bodied people, they don't get the actual photo. And they're all based on real photos. Disability is the crescendo of a Bette Midler song with photo illustrations. One, first the strings, see her face smooth as paper, flawless, rouged, her lips, oh, her tongue fluid against teeth. Next, the piano, then the strings. Dear God, the strings again and again. We slow, now the winds, her eyes lift. She knows what's coming. We slow again, though the notes climb and climb. Two, accessibility note. Photo of a young girl in a cloth diaper and white bonnet. She clutches her father's wooden back scratcher in her right hand, sword and club. Photo paper curls at rounded corners. Something sticky resides on the mat backside and a blue pinned date from a mother's hand fades. As a woman, this young girl will regret all the ways she used her body. Three, and the strings the strings, the strings. Her neck only so slightly exposed, but then her chin lifts more, imperceptible. Her face a porcelain mirror, her voice a hammer. Four, accessibility note. Photo of a young girl and a woman, both are smiling. Both let sun stream through their curls, Invite wind to tossle, joust hair across cheeks. The woman thinks about the night she lay in her son's bed while the house slept, imagined her children living on after her suicide. The woman must learn to walk over and over. Pain streaks down the backs of her legs like worms under the skin of a crushed roadside deer. Five. Her voice hammers a period into the air after each word. This climb is crescendo. Ugh. This climb to crescendo is agony, but vibrating and pure in the bones like him. Recognize the cry, like calls to like. She is too contained, marble smooth, as her hand, a bird's somber flight call gestures, oil dancing on water. What's next? All right, a couple more. Can can you handle a couple more? Okay, signs. <laughs> um, the there's a church by our house, and for for years it had this um, on the, the what are those called outside the. Marquee. Yes, marquee. See, if I my next book should be called "What's That Called?" Because I can't recall anything. All all the time, I ask people, "Okay, what's that thing that looks like this?" Okay. Anyway, for years, and it made me crazy to drive by and see it. And finally, they changed it. And, thank God. Um, signs one. The neon at Prairie Flower Bible Church blinks. 
Jesus is King every Sunday on Jesus' name. Flags at half staff again. The faith makes a family, folks are at our door again. Now alarm installation, water filtration, timeshare. Pumpkins rot on our porch, mouths collapse into grimaces. Our daughter says brains look like pickles. <laughs> Two, I once kept a lover. She played the squeeze box and the echo quiet stairwell of our two-story house. A softer sound lives now like cedar and citrus and cast iron. The gray painted end table, plastic primary toys, even our shirts and socks. Today, ice groans off tree limbs and eaves. I imagine all my past lovers slip, shatter on rivering walkways. They deserve it. <laughs> Three, my son prays I will find him when he dies. I know better at this age than to ask for signs. Peyton lounges on my legs, beautiful as something round and delicate inside a bowl of melted sugar spun to glass. I swear, I'm glad I'm alive, breathing. Our baby wakes each morning at 2.13. I'm in Missouri, glistening like a long reverberating moan. Four, a boy once held me down in his bed. His sour beer breath scratched between my breasts. He caressed my hair, traced the swirls and bends. Boys in the next room played the clash. Imagine prairie chickens. Imagine their bodies slit from neck to belly and the gleam of their guts reflects in your eyes like spit on mud, like a woman's arms lifting in feathered flight. Four. I'm searching for a religious experience. Atheist joins church, sobs through every service. Crowd radiates light like marbles from their eyes. I am slack-jawed. A fine and terrible line lives between nothing about my body feels good and nothing, like a CDC newsletter warning about gynecological cancers. Inevitable. because we say the word MS in our house, Alexa and the TV seem to know that I have MS and every commercial on the television now is about MS and that's the ending of that is, um, is a similar idea, like I must have at one time searched something and for uh, like a month everything on my Facebook was about gynecological cancers, like it wouldn't go away. It seemed like a sign that I should probably go to the gynecologist, but <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Um, okay. Uh, my neurologist who doesn't have MS explains pain is not a symptom of MS. One. This is the chapter about hope. Fuck him. Please know we write every chapter out of order, words too. Today, I haven't walked for three weeks. Pain seizes my muscles, changes my gait to hobble. Maybe this is the handbook, maybe this handbook is a love letter to the lady doctor who diagnosed me after the men sent a paralyzed woman home from the hospital twice. Remember, you're allowed to say fuck sometimes. Fuck is true, fuck feels good, fuck. Hotspur, I won't say that when I meet with the teenagers. Some of those kids are cool. Yeah. <laughs> Two, <laughs> write your chapters, send them by post. I want you all like bitter wine in my throat, chocolate, Brussels sprouts. Some people genetically can't taste bitter. You all taste sweet to me. My husband tells me, doctors can't help because nothing can be done. Imagine, imagine chrysalis, butterfly. Disability isn't always like the child born blue and still. Some is simply a dream of rewind, how a person can never go back to their warm, bloody shell. Three, I get to say languishing. 
I get the bright squeezing fluorescent of up again at 3 a.m. You don't. Also, joy. My legs are my father's hand on the small of my back of the stairs, my daughter's head in my crying lap. I'm shrieking joy. I'm shrinking into my daughter's hair wet on her wild neck, rocking to soft violin and piano, cello, viola, bassoon, joy in her hair itch tickle, joy in motion, delicate toddler, sour smell, flesh and soil and crushed dandelion milk. Four, I want to tell the doctor I'll never fully be with another person again, fully with me. I live in legs now, live and twinge and tingle. I live in each electric jolt. Legs are my true love now. When I fuck, I'm thinking of legs. Erica writes to me, we are a sort of mourning. Laura, any flower that brings, Huascar, that bridge will hold. We find each other in the middle. That feels good, true. Even birds, black swoopers and divers call out for us to stay. Five, like a movie car accident on pause, we are all always breaking. I mean all. When you spend too much time with pain, pain opens you, zippered up down center mass, Pain pulls and pulls at the holding weave. Pain is a tall city of red and beating wings under skin, glass and skyscrapers and endless honking. Do not become machinery. I'm wrapped in a blanket. Small hairs breeze my face. In the chapter about hope, pain must become aphorism. I'm going to read. One more. Um, this is the last one. The epigraph um, is from Moby Dick. Uh, there is a peculiar emptiness about the color white. It is the emptiness of the white that is more disturbing than even the bloodiness of red. And the chapter is titled White. One, I'm done, I tell my friend. We both remember how she contorted as the doctor pulled the port from her chest, how chemo dripped thick and red into her chest and her white breasts scooped from skin, how we peeled back bandages to watch the empty skin flap against her stomach. She once nursed her newborn son. I know I don't have to explain. Two. After the birth of my daughter, every room yellowed, every fa face yellow, and my own yellow hand couldn't touch any of the yellow slicked world, yellow as a light cut between my body and every other body. Now every room is white and glowing, white glows from our windows like something terrifying lifting from a field. Three, I think now that becoming queer was easy, Easy as forgetting being born. Petechia on the forehead, purple stippled cheeks and chest, fragments under new skin, holding on to how it felt to be fully embraced by another body. But a mother's body contracts as it must to save love from drowning. Four, our doctor who sits one row in front of us at church prescribed the pain pills. His face so pink and embarrassed, I stopped asking. I ask friends now, embarrassing. I take the pills anyway. I forget everything three times before I remember. Five, the white of wanting to die streams from my eyes. Even, even the ceiling glows white from my want. In the MRI machine, in the blood room, drawing, spinning, labeling, in the hard chair, the papered bed, metal needle liquid, the light illuminates how my legs now crumble beneath me. When you read your chapter for the, when you read your handbook for the newly disabled, you'll want someone to hold you. That's it, that's all I have.
Do you have many, many questions, I assume? <laughs> I have a question. Oh, OK. <laughs> are, you, are you familiar with the book, The Body in Pain? Elaine yeah, Scary. Elaine Scary. Yeah. yeah, I did a ton of research for this book and, oops, gosh, of course, and cataloging pain. So I have piles of them. And it, like all poets, it really led to some weird places because then um, I have this book called Anesthesia, and it's, you know, like a documentary exploratory, like, look into what happens really when we're under anesthesia, because I had this uh, spinal surgery, and the doctor said they had to keep stopping because my blood pressure would drop, even though I was anesthetized, that I was in so much pain that my body was reacting under anesthesia. And so, yes, I have read The Body in Pain and piles of others, and I have a list. I couldn't decide if I should put something in the back that said, please read this, because I, or um, these things were inspired by, and the um, Rembrandt self-portrait, Damaged by Acid, is, is it that in that book, or a different book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so then there's there's one pain book that has um, that image in it and inspired that poem. It's a good connection to make. If anybody wants about 30 recommendations for books about pain, so um, I, the first book I read that really got me like just super interested well, because I am in constant pain, that got me interested in this idea of pain, but um, Sonia Huber's Pain Woman Takes the takes Your Keys, or The Keys, um, was the first book I read after my diagnosis, and um, just having lived with all of this pain, and I'm sure my husband remembers, like, I just was sobbing the whole time because I was, every page was like, yep, yep, thank you, yes, please validate this some more. And, um, uh, and so I, I've taken um, a quote uh, from that book that's in my Cataloging Pain book um, because she's been su just such a huge inspiration. Um, you should follow her on Facebook because she's part of, this will never come to me, but there is now a national or like pain advocacy organization that she has helped start found something, um, and uh, you can sign up for their newsletters. And they're really working to sort of change the conversation around chronic pain and how our war against opioids has really hurt people who are in chronic pain and need medication legitimately and so they're they're doing a lot of that work and she's fascinating and very kind and would probably accept all of your friend requests. <laughs> Good question. Does anybody else have questions? I was curious about um, that, that first uh, poetry you said uh, that you found that that was a great, great way for you to deal with trauma. I was just wondering if you would elaborate on that a little more. Sure. Uh, so in my MFA, um, my um, wife left me and my three small children. Uh, two, not three. Yeah, sorry, honey. <laughs> the third ones are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll be in trouble later. Uh, so my two small children. And so I had been writing about whatever you write about as a young MFA student. And then all of a sudden, um, the poems got really uh, bleak bleaker than these if you can imagine um, but in a really bad way <laughs> I'm like you know my soul is black that's I think is probably what I was handing in and Sally Keith was my mentor at the time and she's a lovely queer writer also and she just sort of said um, these are really depressing <laughs> like um, she didn't say they're terrible but I could tell that's what she <laughs> meant <laughs> And she said, why don't you um, 
find an artist, and I think it was she was like from 19 whatever on, and write a poem as if you're inside the painting. And she also gave, I mean, like lots of other exercises, like she said, take this poem and rewrite it five different ways. And um, so the, the first poem that I ever wrote um, like that is in here, and it's in its promises attached to this world. Um, and it's after Joan Mitchell Snowbirds, which is fascinatingly a painting in response to Van Gogh's painting, Wheatfield with Crows. So it's, it's like a weird, you know, building and building. And somehow it kind of allowed me to, it's the poem is written to my um, daughter, my, my middle daughter. Um, and it was like, a, it like put a filter between me and the audience and me and the pain. And um, it, I, and I don't know that that poem's actually that good, but the, the book is very good. Um, but so it was, it was like the start of me thinking about how do I write through something? And that's how I think about um, ekphrasis now is instead of, I'm not gonna describe something, I'm gonna, uh, now I use it for inspiration. So as you saw with the Kardashian poems, a lot of times I'm not totally writing about what's happening in the episodes, but the theme has inspired it. But certainly when I'm writing about paintings, because a lot of them have paintings too. If you see that Gino Severini painting, um, you know, there's pockets, uh, there's a pocket and there's flowers and there's, so a lot of the images, I don't want to say are, are stolen or appropriated, but uh, borrowed <laughs> from those paintings. So I, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of different techniques for you doing a process that I've um, learned. Um, but for me, the biggest one is that there's distance now. I think people, I, you know, maybe in these later books, I'm like, I don't care anymore. I'm going back to the like raw in your face. But I think like people have a really hard time sometimes sitting through that much raw pain. And especially if you're gonna do it like straight out. So I don't know who, who said it, tell it, but tell it slant. And for me that process has been a way to, to slant what I'm saying. That was a long answer. I'm sure it was a dead white guy that said, tell it, but tell it slant. <laughs> <It's definitely Dickinson. laughs> oh, is it really? So. Okay, crap. <laughs> Emily Dickinson. Dead white woman. Dead white woman. <laughs> I feel like everything I know is dead white guy, so I always just am like, yeah, it's a dead white guy. <laughs> we like Emily Dickinson. We'll give her credit for that. I would have gotten away with it if poetry people weren't in the front row. <laughs> I like that. I like what you what you're saying about like using the the sort of like third space yeah. as like a way to mediate pain. I think it's, it's mm -hmm. that sort of like you can't really see something if you're this close to it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I think. Art has, you know, art has something to say anyway, and so um, it feels like a really interesting exercise to, because so poetry students a lot of times will say, well, this is what it means to me, and that's fine, but if you really read it, you know, poets do mean something, you just have to work hard to figure it out, and I think people say that of art too, and it's really hard to look at this and say, oh, Joan Mitchell meant this. <laughs> but when you read her biographies, and you know, she did mean something, you know, and she had intention. And yes, we all bring our past and our, you know, our educations and our biases to the art that we're looking at. But I think um, there's like a push and pull with Ekphrasis of like, there's the artist's intention and your interpretation. And so then when you're, when you're writing it frastically, all of that gets piled into, you know, 
um, like trolls, I think of poems need layers. <laughs> and uh, it all adds to the experience of what you're saying. And, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm famous someday, I will, you know, project the images behind me because I think that um, sometimes it just really, I mean, I know that, or I know and I hope <laughs> that it adds to the experience of reading the poem because you definitely then get all of those oniony kind of layers. That's a, that was a weird answer. I have small children, as you know. <laughs> <All> the onions. <laughs> Anybody else want to talk about stuff? So I am doing an Brasses workshop and um, we're, we'll listen to some um, uh, rap music with swearing and we'll look at um, <coughs> old dead white guy for sure uh, poems about jars and we'll look at um, dance and all kinds of places that you can find inspiration for writing about art. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you enough for coming here. <laughs> Thanks for all of you sitting through my reading. Especially to my husband. <laughs> for his 100th. <laughs> Who knows?